the sustainability management master's program you are answering one simple question do you care about your future generation you now if you care about your kids their kids their grandkids then you care about sustainability and a sustainability manager is someone who has the tools to make people understand how they can contribute towards developing a sustainable world we have both part time and full time students our curriculum is 30 hours instead of thesis we have a research project course and a seminar course which provides them with the kind of research background they will need to be successful in their job but at the same time sustainability is not always everything about environment it also relates to the business they will take a sustainable business strategies course they will take a project management course most of these courses are going to be taught by industry people the people who are doing sustainability on a daily basis as a part of their job any organization that has a large number of employees and has a physical infrastructure they will have to have a sustainability office if you have the passion to develop and maintain a sustainable world come to us and we will help you shape your passion into a career which will create an impact thank you um so you notice that my degree is in elementary education okay so i'm not going to pretend to be an expert on nuclear energy um but i really am passionate about outreach so it's really about finding a message that i love and that i think is super important and then i just pick everybody's brains as much as i can so i go through our entire company and i just keep asking questions and questions and questions and experiencing everything and trying to connect all those dots so that i can bring it out to the public because um like he had said i run the energy and environmental resource center so my groups start with fourth graders through 100 year olds um i have everybody come through my facility the majority of people know nothing about nuclear let alone energy So um it's really starting from the ground up and you probably are much more aware of some of the things that I'm going to talk about than the general public that comes into my facility. Um one of the interesting things is while I teach fourth graders electricity and I'm trying to um you know come in and bring uh engineering students in take them for tours through the nuclear plant and let them understand the technology it's bringing legislators in and teaching them not just about nuclear but about energy most people you, you don't think about electricity we don't think about energy it's just i plug in my phone and it better charge i don't care where it's coming from i try and tell students all the time someday your parents are going to kick you out of the house and you're going to have to pay for your electric bill and i guarantee you will care how much it costs um The good news is is that students are much more aware now than even 5 years ago when I started on the impacts of producing energy. So they start thinking environmental right now and it's not just you know how much does it cost and do we have it. So some of the things we're going to talk about and let me say that I do get really excited about this information. So if I talk too quickly just shush me or you know raise your hand. Um this is also an interactive conversation. So feel free to ask any questions that you have um and then if I don't know the answer I will find the answer for you. I will put you in contact with people. Um I feel like I've already made some really great contacts um and what you're doing we can really connect with one another and I can help you in any way that you need. But we're going to start out with the um global energy picture and then we're going to narrow it down to the United States and then we're going to narrow it down even more to New Jersey so that we can look at um, how are we producing energy in New Jersey. And I want to talk about energy diversity. Then I'm going to talk about um the nuclear industry. How do we produce energy at a nuclear plant because usually that's the furthest from what people know. Um so I will give you that information if you're technical. Sorry. I'm not going to get crazy technical. Um and then we are going to talk about our estuary program. So PSEG has the largest privately owned estuary program in United States. We have about 21,000 acres that we take care of. So, it's a really exciting um program. I want to give you kind of a commercial on that and then show you where you can find more information. Um because it's really really fascinating. Now, the energy center that I operate, I'm really proud of it because um we actually when our chief nuclear officer 
and our leadership went over to Europe, we were talking about building a fourth reactor. They went over to Europe and they realized that a lot of places that they were visiting that were building new nuclear had an educational center. So they came back to New Jersey, they did some research and realized that New Jersey residents knew very little about energy and very little about nuclear. So they thought it would be a great fit to make an educational center. We've had about 30,000 people visit since we opened our doors in 2010. Um, and we really walk the walk. So our floors are cork flooring, we have the environmentally friendly paint, we have the toilets that, you know, less water, um, the lights throughout the building that are coming on and off. So it's great to be able to bring people in and show them those things, that these little differences really do add up. And especially when you're a business, it's really important that you set a standard. Um, once you set it at the leadership, then make sure that they follow through with that. So I'm really proud to work for a company that's very much about sustainability. And while I'm going to talk um, today about nuclear specifically, there's tons about PSEG um, because we're a large company of about 12,000 people. So if you have thoughts um, with what, maybe it might not be the nuclear portion of the business, but about other portions of the business, I'd be happy to connect you with people in our corporate headquarters or in Edison or Long Island, because again, it's a very large company. Um, and I also just learned yesterday that we actually um, awarded Stevens a $1.5 million grant over the next three years. So it's really going to be a collaborative effort. I know, it's really exciting. Um, it's going to be a collaborative effort between the students and some faculty and our actual um, employees to work on some energy, um, energy, they're not just focusing on renewables, but picking your brains, um, collaborating and coming up with some new ideas and figuring out what are we missing in the industry? What can you bring to us? What mentoring can we bring to you? And I think it should be a really exciting partnership. So keep your eyes peeled for that because it's definitely some good opportunities with internships and mentoring and things. Okay, so we're start going to start by talking about uh, the world's population. The black line represents the world po world's population. There's over seven billion people in the world. It's not going to stop growing anytime soon, right? But the red line represents the United States population. So we're only 5% of the world's population here in the United States, but what's alarming is that we are consuming about one-fifth of the world's energy. What's even more alarming, I think, is that not that many years ago, China finally passed us in being the number one consumer in energy. And why should China be the number one consumer in energy? Their population, right? They have a lot more people than us. So when you think about all the ways that we use energy, and I know that we really talk about energy efficiency now. And if you think about our kitchens, all of the appliances you have, and maybe your parents have remodeled a house, so you get the new Energy Star appliances that are really fancy and you're really excited about that. However, that old energy guzzling refrigerator, you don't get rid of it, you put it in the garage or in the basement. Or, you know, when I was a kid a really long time ago, we had one TV even imagine. Um, and now think about all the TVs that we have in our houses and all the phones and all the computers. So the equipment is more energy efficient, but we're using so much of the equipment. So it's super important to talk about energy. And usually in normal conversations in everyday life, who talks about energy? It's our job to do this, to bring this to people's attention. And I think that just starting the conversation is going to get people thinking and talking about it. So here's the world tonight. We already said that we're a bunch of energy hogs here. Um, the lights are on in a few other places. India. Have you ever been there during one of the power outages? Or, yeah, so probably an inconvenient time. Is there any convenient time to have a power outage? No. But yeah, rolling brownouts. So we do get pretty spoiled here in the United States that we expect it to be on. Who lost their power during Superstorm Sandy? Did anybody lose it for more than a week? Yeah, how traumatizing that is. Um, I know I, one of my friends, his brother is a uh, police officer in New York City, and he's on Stanton Island, and he was on riot patrol during Superstorm Sandy. He had to sit at this gas station because you need electricity to do, you know, to pump the gas, 
and so they could only pump it at certain times. And people get really angry when they don't get gasoline, when they're waiting in those lines. So we take for granted how important electricity is because it's always here. So we really need to think about how important elect electricity is and how we're going to make it. So how are we making electricity around the world? What do you think the number one way that we're producing electricity around the world versus the United States? Now, I talked to you earlier. We fed you donuts. Now, you should be awake. What do you think? Thermal power plants. What was that? Thermal power plants. Power plants? Thermal. Thermal? Thermal? Oh. Anybody else? <coughs> Does anybody think renewables? Sure, yes. OK. Fossil fuels. So about two-thirds of the world's energy, whether you're in the United States or anywhere in the world, is coming from fossil fuels. So you'll hear sometimes, or you'll read, we need to get rid of fossil fuels. I can't say if that is right or if it's wrong. That's not for me to decide. But is it going to happen anytime soon? It's two-thirds of the world's energy. And I know this is a huge conversation right now here in New Jersey. So we're dearly dealing with it very, very, uh, on a personal level, with nuclear and with the governor. So renewables are very important. And he wants full renewables in New Jersey by 2050, I think it is. Um, so is that possible? Is it feasible? Those are the questions that we need to ask. Just because it sounds good, we're not going to be like, yeah, we're on board. Let's ask questions. How? Why? What are the pros? What are the cons? If there's one thing I want you to um, leave here with, is understanding that every single energy source has pros and it has cons. And I'm not going to stand here and tell you that nuclear is perfect or renewables are perfect. Nothing is perfect. So they're all pros and cons. So it's your job to ask questions and learn all those pros and cons and make your own decisions. If you learn about nuclear from me, go ask five more people about nuclear. Don't take my word for everything. I'm going to try and give you the most honest information that I have, but I am a little partial to nuclear. Um, here in the United States, we're getting one-fifth of our energy from nuclear. Can anybody name any nuclear plants? I can't go past that? Yeah. Okay. I need a buzzer. Shock me if they do. Okay. Who can name any nuclear plant? Down by me, Oyster Creek. Oyster Creek, yes. Indian Point. Indian Point. This is exactly my point, right? People don't usually know about nuclear, and guess what? That does not offend me, because that means we are operating safely, efficiently, um, not bothering the environment. So we normally just fly under the radar with nuclear. It's my job to get out and teach people about nuclear and let you know the benefits of it, let you know what the dangers are and how we plan for those and take precautions with those. I could not feel any safer living near a nuclear plant and working at a nuclear plant. One of my best friends is going to have a baby any day and she's still at work at the nuclear plant. It's just not a concern. We know how safe we are. So where are these nuclear plants? Everywhere. We have 99 in the United States. But nuclear is in a really weird place right now. Plants are starting to shut down. Um, a lot of it is economics. So um, we'll talk about that a little bit, but they are in the rest of the world too. Um, the thing is, is that if nuclear were to go away in the United States, I just know how the nuclear industry works in the United States. Very safe, very um, transparent operations, both within our plant, within our community, and within the industry. We don't compete against one another. So if all of you represent nuclear plants all around the world, we share everything. This happened good, this happened bad. What do you do when this happens? We're constantly benchmarking each other to get best practices. So it's really a unique industry. But if the United States shut all the nuclear plants down and we no longer have a seat in that international nuclear picture, that brings me great concern. Because I want to make sure that I know we're doing things right in the United States. I want to make sure to have a seat at the table with the rest of the world when they're building nuclear plants. OK, so we're going to move into New Jersey now. This was the energy picture back in 27, or 2007. Nuclear was giving 
about half of the power here in New Jersey. And people still couldn't name us, that's okay. Um, natural gas, 30%, we had quite a bit of coal at 16%. Renewables and other. Then we all know about the gas boom. So that Marsalis shale here in the red, that one has really um, started a boom in the gas industry with the horizontal fracking. This is a great thing. I know I moved my gas over from uh, oil to gas. I'm very, very pro natural gas. The prices are wonderful. Um, it adds diversity. But what happens is this really changes the price of electricity. So it's one of the factors that changes the price of electricity. Natural gas, there's so much of it, it's practically free. So that brings the price of electricity down. And while that's good for consumers, because all of us want low prices, right? It's also a problem because then it's kind of an artificial pricing. So if nuclear costs $30 a megawatt to produce and we're only getting paid 10, you can only maintain that for so long because eventually it is a business, okay? Now, we're producing a lot of energy for New Jersey. So where does that lead us? 2007 versus 2016. The boom with natural gas obviously occurred and now we're 50% natural gas in New Jersey. We've cut back here. Coal has all but gone away by 2016. In 2017's numbers, coal will be gone in New Jersey. So we are producing 37% at our nuclear reactors. We have three reactors. So we're producing 37% of the energy in New Jersey. And then Oyster Creek um, is 7%. It was originally going to retire in 2019, go offline. They just announced yesterday um, that it's going to be 2018 now. October of this year, Oyster Creek will close its doors. So that's, I believe they make enough power for about 800,000 homes. So that will be replaced with natural gas. I know for our company that we're transitioning our coal plants into uh, gas plants. We're building new gas plants in different places. So our company is very diversified, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, still, solar, 1%. Hydro, zero. Other, other's the biggest, 2%. In 2016, what was the biggest way that we made um, renewable energy in New Jersey? Wind. Nope. That's always a good guess. The donuts have not kicked in yet, Bishop. Sure. No, they have not kicked in. Solar. Nope. Solar. That's usually the first. Uh, I'm going to go out on a limb and say geothermal. No, but good try. So think about this. We are a very densely populated state, right? So what do we make a lot of? Waste, trash, landfill gas, biomass. So think about this. When you think about renewables, is this my line? Yes. Okay. <laughs> when you think about renewables, you think about clean, right? So is burning something clean? So what we want to do is ask questions. If we said, let's transition to all landfill gas, we wouldn't be stopping the carbon from going into the atmosphere, right? So you ask, well, what's the problem that we're trying to solve? Who here is an engineer? Do you worry about problem statements? Yeah, so our president will be the first one to say, get your problem statement correct before you try and solve it. So is it getting renewables? Is it getting clean energy? Like really what's our problem that we want to accomplish or that we want to fix in New Jersey? So that's part of the conversation. Here's something that's affecting nuclear as well. So all of that natural gas and then solar. Solar's awesome. We have 11 sites across the country, um, 11 solar sites across the country for PSEG. So we are like one of the top producers um, company-wide in or company-wise in the United States so we're very pro-solar and doing our part to bring that about but if this is how much you can sell nuclear for the wholesale price solar will get that price too but then they also get these subsidies so who here does pay an electric bill every month okay so I can't think of the name of it right now societal benefit charge if you look on your bill 3% of your electric bill every month is the societal benefit charge, and that goes towards renewables. Okay, so that's fine, right? Because we want to get the renewables up and moving. So that's this, or I'm sorry, 
that's this going on, your energy credits. So they're getting the credits to do that. This is the private solar. They also get the net metering payment. So as they produce it and put it out onto the grid, they're not paying Niagara Electric Bill and things like that. So in the end, they're getting the price that electric is made at, but then they're also making all of this. And that's fine. However, if natural gas takes very little to make it, and then solar's making all that, they're benefiting, that's great. But now let's look at where does this lead us to in the future? Have you heard the phrase, don't put all your eggs in one basket? Okay, so, and let's also look back here for a second. Natural gas is 50%. So if nuclear goes away, what does that get replaced with? Is it gonna be replaced with renewables? Good. You've seen renewables growing in New Jersey, correct? In the past 10 years? But this is where they still are. Renewables and other are two. Renewables and other are 3% over that time span. So is this going to happen in the next two, three, five years? Probably not. So here's the energy mix from 2002 to 2014. This is what has happened. So the coal, we know that that's going away. The um, natural gas, that's growing and getting bigger. Nuclear has stayed the same. We're not building new nuclear plants. Um, we're up until this point, there weren't a lot that were shutting down. So that's gonna stay about the same because we run at about 97% efficiency. So we're running as well as we can. You can't run at 100% because you have to shut down every year to um, do a refueling and maintenance outage. So this is at peak performance. And then our renewables, <coughs> they've definitely been growing, but they're still a pretty small part of the energy picture um, in the United States. Now we're gonna make a few assumptions. We're gonna move the demand growth at 0.9% every year. Coal is gonna decrease by 2% a year. Renewables, we're gonna give them a huge bump, 5% a year. Now you know that that's big, right? Because they haven't been doing that. And then nuclear um, retirements, that are going to happen. And then there are a few nuclear plants that are coming online down south in the um, regulated market. So, this is where we were in 2010. The coal keeps going down, which we know it's going to. The gas keeps going up, and nuclear all but goes away. Renewables, we've been jumping leaps and bounds every year, and this is still where we get to. So what are we dependent on in this picture? Yes. Natural gas. Now, how does natural gas get to your houses or to those um, gas facilities that are making your electricity? Pipelines. Pipelines. Pipelines, that's right. So, when you think about it, if I'm the big pipeline that's coming from the Marsalis Shale, okay, and while a coal plant has coal at their facility all the time, so if there's a major flooding, it's not like they need to get the coal in. Um, nuclear has uranium, they have fuel in the reactor for 18 months, so you're all set with that. But this gas, you turn it on and off at your gas plant. So if that pipeline goes away, you have no fuel. So the thing is, is that if half of you are our gas um, plants in New Jersey, and I'm big enough to supply all of you with the fuel that you need, what happens when all of you get built because everything else has gone away? I can't supply all of the gas to you. So what do we need to do? We need another pipeline, right? Which sounds super easy, except people will fight. You're not building another pipeline through my town. You're not going to run that past my school. First of all, we have gas pipelines all over the place already, but trying to get a permit for one of these things, very difficult, but that's where we're headed. So if that's where we choose to be, then we need to give in and get pipeline built. What's the other thing? We talk about terrorists all the time, right? Bad things happening? What happened if they took me out as a pipeline? There's no fuel. Actually, last, I think it was last April, there was actually um, a pipeline that exploded. I believe it was in Pennsylvania. Luckily, it was April. So everyone didn't have their heat on and their air conditioners on, so it wasn't a peak season. Otherwise, with that one line ruptured and out of service, there wouldn't have been enough to give everyone their electricity and heat. So again, it's planning for the future. What do we choose to do? So if, all, if that's where we're headed, that's fine, but we need to prepare for it. 
Okay, so jumping on to our company, um, you've heard PSENG, you've heard PSEG, what in the world is the difference? So PSEG is Public Service Enterprise Group, and we make the power. So it's the nuclear plants and the gas plants. Um, it's even our solar part of the company. We have PSEG Long Island. They've taken over the electric power in Long Island. And then we have PSENG, Public Service Electric and Gas. So do any of you have the, um, PSENG as your supplier? Yeah, so those are the cars, the vans, and everything that you see out on the um, streets. So all together, we're at about 12,000 employees. So we're very, very large. And from a recruiting standpoint, one of the neat things about the company is you can move all over the place. You might start at nuclear, you want to go up to corporate, you want to move out to Long Island, you want to be in marketing, and then you want to go into operations. And it's really neat, all of the growth opportunity. And um, you know, the more you move around, the, the more likely you are to be a leader, because now you have all of that diverse training and understand the real parts of the company. So our company, this is what our fuel diversity, if we ran everything full speed, we're mostly gas, a lot of nuclear, and then still some coal, which again is, is um, switching over to natural gas. And then we have actually a large part of our company, 4% is um, oil, and then our 2% is pump storage. This is what we actually produced in 2016. In 2017, we had an amazing year with nuclear, so we actually were over 60% for the first time in our company history. So nuclear is a very big part of our company because we run so efficiently and nonstop. So it's a big part of PSEJ. So here's the nuclear plant. This is Salem Unit 1. It came online first, Salem Unit 2, and then Hope Creek. So we have three reactors and we're powering about 2.7 million homes every day. So it's a lot of power. Now before I came in and we said nuclear plant, what would you have pictured? On this picture, what would you have seen in your head? Three-eyed fish from Simpsons. Three-eyed fish? Yeah. What, what could... Tower. That, the cooling tower, right? Which has nothing to do with nuclear. So coal plants can have cooling towers. So that's the first myth, is that that is the nuclear plant. So this is the nuclear plant. I think it's just so boring if you just drew this dome. You'd be like, what is... The dome. So I think that's how the cooling tower has gotten its reputation as nuclear. Um, but the other thing is, how many cooling towers do we have? One. And how many reactors do we have? Hmm. So it doesn't match up, right? So Hope Creek utilizes the cooling tower, while Salem Units 1 and 2 utilize a once-through circulating water system. It comes directly from the Delaware River and goes right back out to the Delaware River. So what is interesting is, the river, the Delaware River, while it's very narrow up here, down south by me, two miles wide. It's huge. So when I tell you how much water we're pulling out of the Delaware River for the once through cooling system, it's a very small percentage. So I'll share that in a minute. So um, making a lot of megawatts for a lot of homes. And we used to be at 3.5 million. And we've actually had up rates since then. So why did our output go down for homes 10 years ago? Energy use per home is increasing. Exactly. Homes are using more energy. So um, we can run, we have a 60 year license for each of our units. We started out with 40 and then we asked the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to um, increase our license 20 years. We had to go through tons of permitting and testing and, and lots of safety things. Um, so we did effectively get our extensions. So we can run until 2036, 2040, and 2046. Um, unless we do something wrong, and they can shut us down tomorrow. Um, we have two NRC inspectors, the nuclear <coughs> regulatory um, inspectors, that are on our site. They work with us every single day. They're allowed to go anywhere. They're allowed to see anything, ask any questions. So total regulation in our industry. We are producing um, more than 90% of New Jersey's clean air emissions. So, Oyster Creek is going away. We're fighting for our lives right now in nuclear, and we'll talk about that in a minute um, with subsidies. If that nuclear went away, so not only would we not be producing that clean energy, we'd be replacing it with gas. 
that is not carbon free energy. So it's something to think about. We're over 90% of the energy and some of it's already going away. I'm sorry, 90% of the carbon free energy and some of it is going away at the end of this year with Oyster Creek going offline. So avoiding 14 million tons of carbon emissions per year, that's a lot. Um, it's actually, if we took nuclear away in New Jersey, it would be like putting 3 million cars on the road. So when you put it into that um, visual, when you think about the turnpike and how much you know, is going out there now with all those cars, imagine three more cars, 3 million more cars. And just, it's amazing, the jobs that we have, 1,600 jobs at the nuclear plant, twice a year we bring in 1,000 additional employees to do our outages. Lots of taxes, and we do so much in the community. That's my favorite part of my job, is helping the community. So how in the world does this work? Uranium is our fuel. Who went to the uranium mine? You went to the uranium mine? Wasn't scary or anything? Not really. No. Um, so uranium is our fuel, and we basically put it into um, a little tiny ceramic fuel pellet. It, goes, it comes out of the mine. It's called yellow cake. So it's this yellow powder, kind of like a gold powder. And it goes through multiple processes until it becomes this tiny little ceramic fuel pellet the size of the tip of my finger. I'm going to take those fuel pellets and they're going to be put into these rods. So imagine a 14 foot long steel rod that's hollow. And then I'm just going to drop the fuel pellets into full, fill it up. And then I'm going to take all of these fuel rods and bundle them together. That becomes a fuel assembly. So that is my fuel. 14 feet high, 17 by 17 for one of our um, reactors. And then I'm going to take 193 of these fuel assemblies and I'm going to submerge them into the water. That's our reactor core. So basically, our end result needs to be to make steam because we need to turn a giant turbine to turn the generator to make enough power for a million homes. So what we have to do is split our atoms. So the uranium atoms, the nucleus filled with the protons and neutrons, just like a balloon that's filled with the perfect amount of air. When we insert that extra neutron in, it's going to split. The only thing we need to know is two things happen when it splits. Number one, it releases energy in the form of heat. And number two, it releases more neutrons so it can continue the fission process. Controlled. That is our key word there. Nothing is haphazard in nuclear. You want to make sure you have control of it so it just doesn't keep going. We keep everything controlled and contained so we control the fission process. So, we have two types of reactors. Um, we're the only site in the country that has two different types of reactors on the same site. So those two Salem units are pressurized water reactors. So they have three loops. So you can see those here. This is the core. This orange loop is what would be in that dome because when that fuel, the fission process that happens and the water gets really hot, that's where the radiation is. So we need to contain this. This is pressurized, so it wants to boil. It gets to 500 degrees hot because we have that pressurizer on it, not letting it boil. And this superheated water just continues around this single loop. Now, imagine these loops here as a whole bunch of straws that have 500 degree water running through them. Now as this clean water comes and goes around those straws, it's going to turn the steam. So now the steam is going to go around, turn the turbine, which is going to turn the generator, which is going to put out power for a million homes. Now the steam, we need that to travel back around because just like this loop with the same water, we want to use the same water here. But the steam won't travel back efficiently. So we need to condense it. So we heated the water up to turn it into steam. So we cool the steam down to turn it into water. To come back around to turn back into steam. So this is the unit, these are the units, one and two, that do not have the cooling tower. So this water is coming right from the Delaware River. Giant pipes. I'll show you in a minute what they look like when they were first built, because they're enormous. 1.1 million gallons of water is coming through those pipes every minute. And we have two units, so 2.2 million gallons of water coming through every minute. 1% of the river flow. That's why it's important that the river is two miles wide at that point. So it's only 1% of the river flow every minute. So it's not a totally disturbing um, number. 
but that's where our estuary program comes from. So I'm going to explain this um, after I go through the uh, boiling water reactor system. Um, because this, once I explain this, it'll make a lot more sense. Okay, so Salem units had three loops with the pressurized. This doesn't have a pressurizer on it at our Hope Creek unit. So it just lets the water boil in the reactor core. Um, this is what's in that dome. The water boils, turns into steam, turns to turbine, gives us electricity. We need to condense it. This is where the water's coming from the cooling tower. Now, something I want to mention is we have control rods here. And from the Salem unit, they come in, they're gravity driven. And the control rods, if you needed to shut down the reactor, you would drop those control rods in and think about them as being magnets where all of those neutrons just cling onto there and you stop the fission process. So shutting down a reactor is super easy. You could drop those control rods in and in 2.2 seconds, the reactor's off. It's the residual heat that we have to make sure that we have backup generators if we lost power. Um, so backup after backup after backup to be able to keep that cooling water in. Okay, so here's the cooling tower. This is looking from the top of the cooling tower down inside. It's 512 feet tall. It's absolutely enormous. Um, you know what? From this picture, you can see it's actually on stilts. And just where the stilts are, water is flowing over. It's just a giant waterfall. Now, where Emily is in this picture I'm going to show you is right above these stilts. There's kind of a crawl space in there, and everything from above Emily's head up is the big hollow chimney that you're looking at here. So these are just kind of some grates so that, this, so that the water vapor can get up through there. So when this is off, we've gone inside the cooling tower. It's fantastic. It's really it's so neat going in there. You expect a lot more when you go in, and it's a very, very simple build. Um, so Emily is in the crawl space, so right below this floor, she goes down in there, and it basically works just like um, a sprinkler system would. So all of these big sprinkler heads, the water goes into Hope Creek, it gets warmed up because it's condensing the steam, it comes back underground, and it runs through two miles of pipes right above those big pillars that you saw at the bottom of the cooling tower. These are those pipes, and it just sprays out of all of these um, sprayer heads, sprinkler heads, and it's just dispersing so that it can cool down. It falls out of the waterfall and collects in a pool so that it can go right back into Hope Creek and do the same thing. But 13,600 gallons of water is evaporating out of the top every minute. So we do pull a little bit of water in from the Delaware River in order to replace that 13,000 gallons um, every minute. So we have environmentalists who want us to you know, the water environmentalists want us to have cooling towers because they don't want you to pull in so much water. But the air environmentalists want us to get rid of the cooling towers and have the once through system because they don't think we should be evaporating the water um, like that. So it's always interesting, like, can we get into a room and everybody network and negotiate and, and learn from each other? And it doesn't happen sometimes because people get so narrow minded and it's just their fact. So it's, it's about having conversations. So whatever you do when you go out into this big cruel world, you know, having conversations and respecting the people that you work with and hearing what they have, because everyone can come out with a, a better solution working together. So here's the refueling floor. So all of that nuclear fuel is underneath this lid. It's actually 40 feet down before you even get to the fuel assembly. So there's 40 feet of water and then the fuel assemblies down there. These people here are actually leaning on the uranium, the nuclear fuel. They're in a case, but it's not radioactive before you put it in the water and start the fission process. It's stable. So they're actually more of a hazard to the fuel because a fuel assembly costs a million dollars and their oils on their skin and things could ruin it. So it's not as scary as everyone thinks. Now when you take this floor off, you would kind of unscrew it, then that's taking some of the shielding away. So what you need to remember in nuclear is it's all about shielding, lead, steel, um, you know, it depends what kind of radiation you're dealing with. It's about distance. The closer I am, obviously, the more that I'm getting. And it's time. I can go in and spend 10 minutes in this spot 
and then leave. Um, we Everybody wears a dosimeter so that they're getting their um, radiation levels detected all the time. And whatever the level that the government says we're allowed to have every year, we cut that in half in the nuclear industry. We're like, no, nah, not even close. So you actually get more radiation by taking a cross-country flight to Denver, one flight to Denver, than you would working at a nuclear plant all year. So kind of interesting. When those dosimeters, you make sure you don't go home and put it on your granite countertops. Don't take it through the airport, through the radiation screens and things, because you'll get a crazy, it drives our um, dosimetry people nuts, because they're like, this is not right. The spent fuel. Pros and cons, we said everything has a pro and a con. The pro of nuclear is it's clean energy. It's not considered renewable, but it is clean energy for three million homes. The con of nuclear, the fuel, it becomes radioactive. So we need to be very cautious with it. It sits out on our lot in these spent fuel casks, 19 feet tall, 12 feet in diameter, 180 tons when they're loaded. So technically the government owns all this spent fuel because when they said build nuclear plants in the United States, they said, build them and we will take the fuel. And then you've heard of Yucca Mountain. Yucca Mountain, Senator Harry Reid said, you know, we want to build this two miles underground. And then once it was almost finished, he said, no, we don't want it anymore. So the government technically owns it. They pay us to keep it on our lots. So every nuclear plant around the country has this spent fuel on their lots. Um, I take tours down this road all the time. And they're like, that's it? It's just not very exciting. In my exhibits, I actually have a mock-up of one, so it's interesting seeing the inside. 27 and a half inches of concrete and lead on each side, um, so very, very robust. And being 180 tons, it's not moving anywhere. Now, talking about sustainability, it's interesting because think about that 14-foot fuel assembly that I spoke of. Now, if you had a Coke can, would you take it and throw it in the trash can? No, you'd recycle it, right? Okay. Nuclear fuel, out of that fuel assembly, you can recycle 95% of the energy. So right now, we're storing 100% of the nuclear fuel, spent fuel, on our lot, but you could recycle 95% of it. But when Jimmy Carter was president, he said we're not recycling it because 2% of that fuel, fuel assembly becomes plutonium, which is weapons grade. So he said, we're not doing that. It's the Atoms for Peace program um, over in France. They get 80% of their energy in France from nuclear. And they recycle their spent fuel. They barely have any of it. So will that be something that you decide to do the next generation? Like, yeah, let's keep nuclear and let's recycle fuel. Is there a new technology in nuclear? We're developing small modular reactors right now, SMRs. Is that going to come along so by the time our nuclear plants, our big nuclear plants shut down, they're replaced with these smaller ones? So lots of technology that's going on. Very, very robust security system. All of these little pink dots represent um, armed guard shacks that are um, manned 24-7. So very, very robust security system for safety reasons. All right, let's get into the good stuff now. The estuary program. These are the sites around the Delaware estuary that we take care of. Everything that we do in New Jersey, we do in Delaware. Because the closest resident to our nuclear plant is actually in Delaware. They're only two miles away across the river. New Jersey resident is five miles away. So we do everything. This is where the nuclear plant is. Um, we have upgraded fish protection system. I'll explain that in a minute in front of that circulating water. Restored over 20,000 acres. Um, fish ladders, extensive biological monitoring. If anybody's into environmental data, oh my goodness, I could hand you over to our estuary program and they could just boggle your mind with all the data that they have. Um, artificial reef programs that we've tried in New Jersey. Okay, so Oyster Creek, I told you that it's shutting down. They are on the Barnegat Bay. Now, one of the things that's happened is I told you that we are bringing in 1.1 million gallons of water every minute. Now we have three units. Well, two of them use the circulating water system. When the water comes in, it gets warmed up a little bit. So we need to make sure it's not going out too warm because we don't want to disturb the habitat for the fish. Now at the Barnegat Bay, it's a much smaller water source. So when they were getting some warmer water and putting it out into the bay, 
It changed the temperature of the bay. The fish loved it. I think they thought they were living in the Bahamas. However, when you shut down that reactor for maintenance and refueling outages, you're no longer putting the water, the warm water back in. It goes back to regular temperature and there's a fish kill. Is that okay? Absolutely not. However, when people hear nuclear plant and fish kill, they're probably thinking three-eyed fish that's floating around. Okay, not the case. So they were told you need to build a cooling tower. You can't do the ones through anymore. And they said, we can't, it's too expensive. Now talking about those conversations with people, um, I don't understand your point and you don't understand my point, so let's have a conversation. The environmentalist will say, it will cost $70 million to build a cooling tower on your site. And they're right. And we say it will cost $700 million to build a cooling tower on our site. And we are right. So how is that? If I'm not listening to your argument and you're not listening to my argument, how are we going to understand? This is what happens. These are the pipes that I was talking about, the intake pipes. These are like the plumbing of the whole facility. These were put in first before we built the nuclear plant. So yes, you can build a cooling tower over here, just like we could build a cooling tower right across the street here. Is it going to serve any purpose if you don't hook it up? No, so that's the $70 million. But if you had to hook it up, you have to dig everything up and totally replace the plumbing. So first of all, $700 million. But second of all, it's never been done. Do we destroy the entire plant? We spend $700 million and ruin it. So Oyster Creek said, we can't do that. We need to shut down which, you know, that's, that's their decision, that's what they have to do. Because of our estuary program, we have been um, allowed to not have to build the cooling tower, but we have to prove with our estuary program that we are maintaining the healthy habitat. So these are gigantic screens that we put in front of these pipes that are out in the river. So think about an escalator that just keeps rotating around. We have these giant screens right here. You see how large they are. Um, the research that we've done, we've made sure we've made it a different type of mesh, um, making sure that the fish, there's two things that we were worried about. The impingement, so as a fish is going through, is it going to get sucked on the screen and not be able to move? So that's bad. So with our improved technology, we've improved or reduced impingement by 88%. We've just changed the flow of the water and things. And then entrainment, that's the fish that can get through. We reduce that by 3%. Obviously, it's a mesh. It can only be so small or so large. So um, baby fish and fish larvae can get through the screens, and that's what would go through the system. It doesn't mean that they're automatically being killed because the water temperature is just getting heated up a little bit. Um, we're not allowed to go past 17 degrees. Um, if we went to 17.1, we would be shut down until we fixed it. So our temperature is maintained constantly. But this is what you hear with um, fish that are being taken out of the environment because of our nuclear plant. It's this entrainment. There's also a little trough at the bottom of each of these screens. So as a fish comes, it's no longer getting impinged. It gets put into this little trough. Cutest fish ever, right? I didn't make it, but I love him. Um, this little fish gets in the trough, and then what happens is, as it goes around, there's a low pressure rinse to wash the fish off, and then they get to slide down our little nuclear Disney World. They go right back into the river. If there's a big fish that comes through there, um, they're taking documentation of it, we're reporting anything that we get, if we get a striper or something, um, all of that is timed. You have so many hours to report this. Um, very, very, very strict regulations. Um, there was actually one time a, um, an endangered striper came into our system, and it, I was on a phone call with our department, and the call was, we have a dead striper. And I was like, okay. And someone said, how dead was it? And I'm like, why would we ask how dead it was? <laughs> why do you think? Yeah. Well, how long has it been dead? Is it like decomposed, or is it fresh? Like, we killed it through our system. So these are the things that we, so you have to do the autopsy and you have to do all the reports. And then if you have a fish, see these sturgeons are gigantic. They kind of look like a prehistoric, uh, they're really kind of weird looking, but it's huge. And 
there's a lot of um, food down where the warmer water is and where all of that debris is, so they like to hang out there. And they're very, very lazy. Like once they get there, they just kind of hang out. So they get into the system, and then we just remove them. But we have to report it. Um, they take pictures of them and you know any birthmarks and things. Because sometimes we have Freddy the fish come back multiple times. He's just content living there. So all of the things that we do. Um, then we also have been working to uh, with all of these, the DEP and DENREC, that's the um, Delaware um, Environmental Commission, um, to preserve and restore the coastal wetlands. So since 1994, we started this program way before it was kind of cool to save the habitat and worrying about fish and fried mighties and all of these things. So I'm going to talk about what we do around here. Okay, so the fish protection was one thing, what we did with our different system. We have dyke salt hay farms and phragmite invasion. Sounds crazy, right? So these phragmites, um, they're these reeds, these really dense reeds. This is actually a strain that is not from here. Yes? Got it. Thank you. Um, these phragmites are very, very dense and they take over the wetlands. They totally knock out the wetlands and take away the habitat. They don't belong here. Um, and they have like this plume on top. So if you ever come down near us, it's when you see, we actually, as you're driving down the road, we have a before that we don't own. That's just very dense, you can't see through it. And then the after, which is a beautiful marshland. Um, so we've taken over some dyke salt hay farms and these phragmites. So basically, of these 21,000 acres, we have three of these dyke salt hay farms. It's always hard for me to say. Three of these areas. Now, when we talk about numbers of fish life that we have um, enhanced, back over here. when we talk about these numbers, even though we've done these phragmites dominated, or dominated um, sites and we've brought back the fish population, we don't count any of these sites' data in our um, data report for fish life because they always had some fish. We weren't starting at zero. We only count the dyke salt hay farm because they were farming that area. They had actually taken the marsh away. So when I give you those numbers, it's only those three of the five sites. Okay, so these are some of the areas, and they're huge. 75,000 linear feet of channel that we're dealing with just in one site, 550,000 cubic yards of dredging. So for any of you environmental, you do a lot of that, you can see how massive this is. Um, really exciting. Okay, so these dyke salt hay farms, they used to, along the marshland, they would dike off so that the tide couldn't come in and they would use that marshland to farm now. So it became one of those fantastic marshes and they would, they would um, do the salt hay for rope. They might use it for bedding, things like that. Well then, the dikes kind of started falling down. They weren't farming them anymore, so they were just useless. They used to be thriving marshland and healthy habitat, and now they're just wasteland in the marsh. So what we did was go in and knock down those dikes. We let Mother Nature come back in. So this was early 1998, it's just a hot mess. By the summer of 2003, this is the natural habitat coming back in. 96, the gray is bad, the gray is death. The fluorescent green is life, that's the good stuff that's come back. And like I said, a lot of this, the channels, you can even see here, there's no blue lines because this was used as farmland. By 97, you see the channels starting to reform themselves because that natural um, tide comes in. There's tons of channels by the end and then tons of that natural uh, spartina and the good grasses that belong there. So again, everything, we have data points on everything. I don't even begin to pretend that I know what it means because there's so much of it, it's fascinating. Then the other sites that we talked about, um, this one, is right near the nuclear plant and we actually have walking paths. I'll take groups, I'll take um, environmental groups down there to see it. We look for wildlife and things. The yellow represents the Phragmites. You can see 
1951, there wasn't any. By 1972, totally taking over the marsh. Very, very aggressive. It can grow 30 feet in a year. And what happens is you have this beautiful channel that's forming. Let's say that this is the channel. Beautiful channel that's going throughout the marshland. And in a healthy channel, it has a nice gradual slope so the animals can get in and out of the water to feed. Also, in that real narrow part of the water, that's the fish nursery. That's where all the baby fish can stay. They're protected from the big fish. That's where they can grow. Now, these Phragmites, their root system is very dense. They grow up to the edges of the channels. And the silt that's coming in and out with the um, tide, it starts to collect. It fills the channel in. You no longer have a channel. So the habitat just goes away. So what we've done is we figured out ways to go in and remove the Phragmites. We've tried burning. We do do some burns. We even bought goats and put them out into the um, fields, but they couldn't get down to the roots, so that wasn't very effective. Um, so we come in and put a, um, a sulfactant on them, a, uh, oh my goodness, help me out here. Hold on. I can't think of it. Fertilizer. What was that? Fertilizer. Um, um, or, um, Rank phosphate. Rank phosphate. What? Um, so that is part, but I'm trying to think of, I'll, I'll come back to it because I'll think of it. Um, an herbicide. We put an herbicide on it. Um, basically like Roundup, except Roundup has something that will help it stick. So that's the bad part of Roundup. So think of Roundup without the bad chemicals in it. We go through and do an aerial application. Um, they come through. It looks like a lot of fun, except this is in mid-August when it's 100 degrees outside and all the bugs are there. Um, and then you eventually, it's so high you can't even see. And then you eventually get to this, which looks kind of ugly, but what you've done is you've taken out the Phragmite, and then the natural grass starts to come back. So this is pre-treatment. We have these stakes all along the area so that we know we're taking pictures in the same places and taking data in the same places. You can't even see the tree line. The channels start reforming, and now you can see the tree line. So this is a huge difference taking um, picture in the same exact place. So again, yellow is bad, the fluorescent green is good. So we've brought back so many thousands of acres of natural habitat. So in the end, what's the point? This would be the biomass production that's lost due to those circulating water. Remember I said baby fish and fish larvae can go through? So this is our calculation of how much fish is taken out of the system. This is what we've brought back from those three salt dike hay farms. Again, it's not, I'm sorry, yeah, the three salt dike hay farms, not the other places where we've taken the Phragmites out. So in the end, we're producing three times more fish than what um, we would be taking out of the system. These are all the different places where we have fish ladders and things. We don't only do that, but we also put in um, uh, different educational uh, places. We do lots of different um, educational uh, discussions, bring kids and adults out to the sites to talk about what it is. One of our places is huge for uh, shorebird migration. It's on the path, so people will come from all over. People will come from all over the world to talk to our estuary team to see what they do. Um, so just lots going on. Just the wildlife that's coming back into our site. Oh, it's the Maurice River Township site. Um, the, the bald eagles, I will drive to the site and down the last three miles of road, I'll see five bald eagles on some days sitting on our transmission towers. The big one would be osprey. Osprey, a little smaller than an eagle. Two minutes. Got it. Okay. So the osprey actually only live in healthy marshes. They were all but gone from the site because the marsh wasn't healthy. They only eat live fish. So if there's osprey there, it's a healthy marsh. Tons of osprey all around. So this is the website. If you check out www.psc.com slash environmental slash estuary, tons of data. You can go on there. If you see more information that you'd love some clarification on or to talk to someone in our team, um, I'd love to connect you to them because they are a wealth of information. Any questions? I didn't make up this stuff, I swear. That's my <laughs> sources, most of it anyway. So thank you. I'm sorry, I get really excited about this stuff. It's awesome. I have cards up here if anyone needs one.
Um, if you want to follow up with anything, if you're ever doing a project on energy, again, I know who to connect you with that can help you with whatever specialty you're thinking. Okay? Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you.